gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce the uh, Rear Admiral Ben Eisman lecture. Uh, Rear Admiral Ben Eisman was born in 1917. He received his, um, uh, at Yale University, his um, BA in 1939, went to Harvard for his MD, and he did his uh, uh, residency between uh, Mass General um, and Washington University. He became a Lieutenant JG in the U.S. Navy um, and became a Beach Battalion Surgeon um, involved in the actions at Normandy, Peleliu, Philippines, Okinawa. And v later in Vietnam and Desert Storm, 1974, he retired as a re uh, retired as a Rear Admiral of the Navy Reserve. He was Associate Professor of Surgery uh, between 1953 and 61, and then became a Professor of Surgery at University of Kentucky. Uh, in 1967, he returned to the um, University of Colorado as Surgeon Chief and uh, um, at the Rose and VA Medical Center. Uh, he became Professor Emeritus in the University of Colorado Distinguished Physician Department of the VA. Uh, his definition of Emeritus and uh, Distinguished, uh, as so fondly recognized by his colleagues, that he left the office early in the early afternoon if he began his day at 0600 hours with five-day weekly rounding and teaching. And he became the uh, Vice President of the American College of Surgeons in 1985 to 86. We are pleased to ask for, uh, next slide please, um, Kent Marie, um, who uh, will be presenting his uh, talk. He's currently the Chief of Trauma Critical Care, Burn and Emergency Surgery. He's a professor of surgery at the University of Arizona. And many of you may have seen him um, in the assistance of uh, Congressman Gifford. He's the Vice Chair of Clinical Affairs at the Department of Surgery and Martin Gluck endowed Chair. He was the director of the Naval Trauma Training Center. Uh, he was professor of surgery at the University of Southern California, LA County Medical Center, and professor of surgery at the Uniform Services University. He spent 24 years of act, uh, on active duty and was one of the first uh, trauma surgeons in Camp Rhino, Afghanistan. Uh, he graduated from USIS in 87, did most of his um, training in the Southern California area did his trauma critical care in Harborview at, uh, in 95, and then uh, also had a diploma of medical care catastrophes in 1999. He currently serves on the American College of Surgery Committee on Trauma. He's uh, involved with the Defense Health Board's Subcommittee on Trauma and Injury, and he, is on the he was on the committee for the uh, TCCC. He's also on the FDA Blood Products Advisory Committee and the Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium's Protocol Review Committee. So without, um, uh, uh, further delay, I'd, I'd like to introduce Captain Marie. Uh, thanks so much for the invitation. Uh, it's really an honor to, to speak uh, on behalf of Ben Eisman. And when I asked what I was supposed to talk about, uh, you know, I think the instructions were kind of loose on that. So I thought what I'd talk about real briefly uh, was on re a little bit about research because I uh, did a lot of my research while I was active duty and then about travel, some, just some random thoughts about traveling. And uh, I know that I'm holding you up for lunch, so I'll try to whip through these if I, as, as quickly as I can. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's surprising that uh, that uh, a Rear Admiral has left us, and he, he's been such an a instrumental part of my career and uh, at USUS as well. Uh, prior service, as you all know, uh, with a long, distinguished history, and it was uh, nice for, him, uh, for me to be able to contact him as often as I did, or him to call me about all the issues that we saw around the world during, his, uh, during the last couple of decades. Uh, we know about his uh, industrious uh, career, but uh, you know, he also has an Eisman Surgical ICU in, in Denver at the VA hospital, <clears throat> and he's done such a huge variety of, uh, of work, including the uh, intravenous coconut water uh, paper that he published way back then. So, uh, you know, I'll try to put this thing together somehow, talk about a few things of research that we did. You know, I, I think that as I look at my old friends in the audience uh, who I've been practicing with uh, for a long time, you know, the one thing that 
it seems to be the theme is that everything that's just absolute dogma has changed so radically. You know, every way I was taught when I was in medical school is almost completely irrelevant. Even the diagnosis and, and language, which I thought medical school was really about, was just a vocabulary lesson. That's all irrelevant now, as we know, the only real uh, way to call the terminology is what ICD-9 calls it and what the E-codes are. So I think that we need to switch school around a little bit in some ways. So talking about travel of how I started uh, as a uh, kid in Korea, that's me on the right uh, with my cousins and my brothers, and uh, how I ended up in Tucson, Arizona, our south of Phoenix, real higher elevation, so it is a little cooler, but it is hot there as, as we go uh, towards Mexico, and you see there's no water around there at all, and so how to go from a uh, Navy to that area, I don't know, but uh, this is the Grand Canyon where, uh, that's up in the northern part of it. Uh, the bottom part where I live is in the Sonoran Desert for most people here who probably have not been to, to Tucson. I know that for me, it, it was, it was a, an eye-opener when I went there and found myself living there. And we're heading out in, uh, pretty soon into monsoon season as well. So the US Navy uh, is a long story about how I got involved and how I ended up going to uses. But this is a, a photograph of my two brothers, uh, my oldest brothers in the middle and my middle brother who's, uh, uh, who joined the military about three months before I did when I went to USIS, and uh, we actually ended up retiring about the same time, uh, 20 years later. Uh, he as a colonel and I as a captain. I, I noticed in the book that I, I got promoted to colonel, uh, but uh, I think he'd find that insulting. But uh, he, you know, unfortunately he's three years older than me, but uh, it, was, it was good that he was able to get promoted a few months before I was, because then that would have been a sore point in our, in our life. But um, I wanted to, to not be a doctor when I went to college and ended up going into medical school and then eventually ended up going to see him uh, because he had a child when I was in medical school and you know, at uses you have to do that military thing. So I ended up going to, uh, going to Pendleton and ended up uh, getting a little bit of an interest with uh, battlefield medicine. Um, after my residency, which was done as an out service in Irvine, uh, traveling on the carrier, and that was uh, you know, a pretty interesting time period, but uh, after that I did my fellowship. And uh, you know, I remember that after my fellowship, the question they asked me was what's, what my preference was, and my answer was anywhere in the world except for Bethesda. And of course, they sent me to Bethesda. So five years in Bethesda is where I started my research, and that was the other interesting part because at the end of my fellowship, I remember distinctly saying I'll do anything about a except for academic uh, medicine. And then, you know, now here I am on the other, other end of the spectrum. Uh, once upon a time, <clears throat> we're told many stories and told many things uh, by people that we trusted and we knew that would never lie to us. But I think over time we find on our own that uh, things that we were taught were not necessarily true. So as we're led in one particular fashion or another by a variety of leaders who are strong and powerful, we have to sometimes wonder where we're being led to. So uh, this is me when I graduate from USIS. It's a happy day for all of us. But that, at that time, what I was taught to do, for example, was that everybody needed two large bore IVs. And we gave them lots of fluids. And we used to call that pounding. And I think that uh, there's a lot of people here who remember that. And I see a lot of people here that have no idea what I'm talking about. And when I did my rotation in medical school, I went to Charity Hospital in New Orleans, worked with uh, Dr. McSwain, and we used to do cut downs for every major trauma and put the actual IV lines in because those catheters were not big enough. And then f soon we figured out a way with exchange systems to, to take those 16 gauge IVs and turn them into 10 gauge IVs. And I was <clears throat> concentrating with the Israeli forces on trying to figure out how to infuse fluids faster. We just could not get the fluids in fast enough. And you know, what we're talking about is uh, hemorrhagic shock, obviously. And uh, what we used to do as a fellow, uh, as a resident, we used to pound fluids, swan everybody, optimize them. And critical care was an exciting time period. We used to do laparotomies on anybody if you had two or three, five cc's of blood in your belly, we, that, that meant that we were gonna examine your internal organs, which is a part of your physical exam. So some of the things we did was <clears throat> we rectalized everybody and then we took a look at inside your abdominal cavity. And you know, all of that has changed so much and so dramatically 
And uh, the, you know, now we're ended up with uh, this type of problems with damage control surgery. So I started my research looking at fluids, uh, Sydney ringers, that great thing lactated ringers, uh, invented in the 1800s and hasn't really changed for 100 years and it's been great for diarrhea, but we've been using this uh, solution for a while. So I had this fantasy I was going to only show six slides and, uh, and this was one of the slides that I was going to show and I'm not going to show six slides, I'm going to show way more than that. But this is my first study that I did in, uh, at USIS. It, it took quite a while to get this study going. Obviously, we all know, uh, people here in the military, how difficult it is to do uh, research. But I'll, I'll cut that story out of this talk and talk about the fact that when I gave these pigs uh, lactated ringers, I saw that their act neutrophils were activated, which wasn't too surprising because we were talking about reperfusion injury or resuscitation injury. And this is where I learned the difference between ischemia reperfusion, which is uh, reperfusion injury, versus what we do, which is resuscitation injury. Huge distinction. Now, <clears throat> uh, some of the older surgeons at USIS advised me that the, the, in, that the real important part about this study was the controls. And I was looking at hypertonic saline at that time period. And we found this new way of, fandangled way of with flow cytometry that look at white cells without you know, teasing them apart from the blood and looking at what it does in milieu and found that when you just gave pigs lactated ringers without hemorrhagic shock that the neutrophil activation was just the same as if you had gone through a hemorrhage and then were resuscitated. But animals that were resuscitated with their own blood did not have an immunologic response, which is the third group which says end resuscitation over there. And then hypertonic saline also did not cause immunologic response. So obviously this was a mistake that I made somewhere in the laboratory with some of my assays. Um, this is my first publication out of USUS at that time period. I had a few as a resident, but this was the real first one. And <clears throat> I just couldn't believe this because this is against everything that we were taught. And I sent this manuscript out to a few people, including Dr. Eisman. And they, they all thought that there was just a big mistake somewhere in my methodology as to why this had occurred. So we had done 45 other publications on this exact same topic about fluids and how to do it and where to do it. And every time I was going around giving that talk, it was just never paid attention to. You know, in the beginning when we first presented this at our meet, national meeting, AAST, I remember there were tomatoes being thrown at me because this was just God's fluid. We brushed our teeth with it, washed our cars with it, resuscitated our patients with it, and we were just, you know, pointing our finger at something that was just absolute dogma. And so this is a, a, a study that I published in Critical Care Medicine that's been heavily quoted, but basically what we eventually summarized everything was that everything artificial that we give into our body has an activation once you give to a certain amount of volume. And things which are natural or low volume basically did not have as much of an activation factor. And I think just that alone, that what you put into the veins makes a difference, is the main aspect. Okay? I think the details of which is better, which flavor is better, doesn't really matter. I get a lot of arguments on whether saline is better than lactated ringers. And you know, when you're comparing bull crap to dog crap, I, th I think that they're both crap. Okay? <clears throat> but the idea that you know, when we bleed blood, that we probably should get blood given back to us. You know, what seems to be so intuitive nowadays wasn't so intuitive back then, just like when we used to do leeches and bleeding and cupping and all of these other things, including blowing smoke up someone's butt. And eventually, to cut that short, we came across this idea of damage control resuscitation, which talks about the use of permissive hypotension, minimalization of crystalloids, using hypertonic saline when you can, um, and then using blood products and even drugs in the future. Uh, this study uh, that John Holcomb was the first author on and uh, that we wrote when we were actually, I was still in uh, Iraq at that time period, has I think adopt, been adopted uh, fairly widely, but the, the main issue is that one that we're starting to recognize that what we do uh, as far as resuscitation with our fluids actually makes a difference. And that was not something that was readily uh, accepted. And now to really have you start thinking about, you know, how do I get blood back into somebody? Because we know the logistics of doing that is not so easy. 
the most important fluids in the pre-hospital phase, and this is a very important uh, fact that we're trying to promote, is diesel. That's what our ambulances require. And now we've eventually gotten around to the point where we're doing massive transfusion protocol. Uh, lactated ringers has also been changed now. Uh, Baxter makes their lactated ringers with L-lactate and not D-lactate. And basically, I would say if I could teach the residents or the younger people here one thing is that there's a dose effect. You know, when you have a headache and you take a Tylenol, it makes your headache go away, but you shouldn't be taking a bottle of this stuff, right? So what we put into our body can be tolerated to a degree, especially when we're dehydrated, but when you're blood loss, when you have blood loss, you're anemic and you start filling that back up, when we get to about eight liters, what we find is that that's when we start to get into the toxic effects. So it does make a difference how much volume you give somebody. And sometimes when you give too much of that, it's like putting fuel into the, into the fire. So <clears throat> again, this is a, a, an algorithm that I wrote up for TCCC. Um, uh, I was able to get this passed because uh, one of the key surgeons that was an opponent to this left the room to go to the bathroom and I was able to get this through the through the committee really quickly. And now that uh, to see that it's adopted where we control bleeding, you use a tourniquet and then you just get them the heck out of there. And uh, you can go by your pulse and your mental status. I think that was a huge issue because before that it was just not something that we were going to adopt. But if you are okay and you have a broken leg and you have a minor injury and these are some of the over triages that you, we were talking about, but some of those people need to get out of theater anyways, the issue is that these people can probably drink a canteen and it'd be okay. So getting those types of concepts uh, into, into, the, into medicine and the dogmas changed, I think, is, the, is, the, uh, is a true satisfying part about research. Now, one of the things I was actually able to do during the war, which was my biggest experimental grounds in my laboratory, was when I started using walking blood bank. Of course, having never done this before and only having read about it, to actually look at people in the eyes and say, yes, we are going to do this. It won't kill anybody. And you start doing this. And people lay down, and you get the blood out of them. And uh, you start infusing it. Uh, that's our medic, who's normally uh, a Pennsylvania tow truck driver. He says, I can't help you when you're operating on my brethren, but uh, I can give you my blood. And then we used to have this voice-activated automatic transfusion device called the chaplain. So making the point that, you know, frozen orange juice and concentrated stuff and refrigerated nasty stuff is it's not as good as the fresh stuff, and that when we talk about blood, it's better to give you the whole blood rather than the components, uh, eating the coffee beans and the sugar one after the other, and then uh, making a coffee in your stomach is not the way to go. So until we get that whole blood coming, uh, we, we have c instituted the massive transfusion protocol, and I think that's now all of a sudden become ubiquitous across the country, and I think that is an advancement that we have uh, made a huge improvement on. Even little things which are improvements that people adopt is satisfying. So what you'll notice here, we don't use the level one warmer anymore, but uh, those bags have numbers on it, so all of our blood that comes out of our uh, blood bank has numbers on it, so you don't have to ask your anesthesiologist, you know, how much of this did you give and how much did you give? When you look up, you know exactly where you're at, where you need to go. So whether this is on the day after or even third or fourth or fifth day in the ICU, when you see uh, uh, unit number 42 hanging, you know exactly where you're standing. So those are little things I think that we'd like to promote. Random thought number one, when I was in uh, uses doing a lot of this research, I did have an opportunity obviously given to me by the military as I was able to uh, accompany President Clinton and, uh, and, the, and, and I did get to see the Great Wall of China through that effect. That picture in the lower left-hand corner is with uh, Connie uh, Moriano, who was a USIS graduate as well, and uh, she was uh, uh, President Clinton's physician who hired me for this gig. So eventually ended up going uh, with the first forward surgical team, which was something also uh, I got a chance to really help uh, mold and, and piece together at USIS, and uh, it was nice that I got to go to Camp Ryan to test that concept out. But, uh, you know, that was as a fleet surgical team, and uh, traveling in these modes are fun and exciting and interesting, uh, especially these concepts where we can elevate trucks uh, with air on the water and, you know, fly across the oceans and, uh, and invade the seas that way and the beaches that way. 
And on the left-hand side, that's the pilot house where it takes three pilots to run one of these things. One guy that controls the air, the other one does the speed, and the other one just uh, uh, points it in the right direction. But uh, during those times in the military, these are the things that I miss the most. I think about my times in the service is the chance to go out and travel and see the rest of the world in all sorts of fashion. Uh, probably the most fun I've had uh, uh, traveling with my clothes on is uh, when you get these spy rigs, you know, flying you around in the air. I'm the second to the bottom, they're the little guy. And, uh, and th that's when you really truly feel like you're flying like a bird. So in Camp Rhino, when we got back, uh, after the time out there, what we noticed was that uh, we needed to get some hemorrhage control. So back to uses uh, to do this model where we would transect the uh, artery. And I told them go through the muscles and they said, well, what about the nerve? Well, that's when a bullet does. When it goes through your artery, it hits the nerve as well. But, you know, let's try these products that the Navy had asked me to do. And this model has uh, taken on a lot of, uh, uh, of use, but we were trying a variety of different products, but this one particular product came out, which is called Quick Clot, where the bleeding was the least and had the highest survival rate. And as a result of that, I think that was the boom in local hemostatic agents with Kytosan and Quick Clot and Combat Gauze and all of those things. This is uh, Matt Martin's uh, patient in, Af in, it was in Afghanistan, right, Matt? In Iraq. It's in Iraq, where uh, they used Quick Clot on this guy out there as well. And uh, there's a whole host of products that are now coming to the world, and I think that this is a good thing and not a bad thing. But uh, the tourniquets, obviously, is also saving lives both in the military and the civilian aspect, and changing that revolution um, to start adopting the use of tourniquets and training people how to use it well was a, a key a factor as well. Monday and Tuesday, I was just in uh, Hartford, Connecticut, Connecticut, where we did the Hartford Consensus Three, where uh, the Vice President Biden is involved in this, as, as well as uh, John Wooden from uh, the Assistant Health Affairs. And what we're planning on trying to do is to see if there's a way we can put uh, hemorrhage control little packets in public arenas. So wherever we see these uh, AIDs, you know, the automatic defibrillators, and in uh, stadiums and in uh, malls and so on, we want to have uh, these publicly accessible, accessible, especially with uh, disaster medicine and terrorism uh, being around. So to see, you know, this hemorrhage control becoming uh, ubiquitous everywhere, starting with you know little things like a, a, a animal model and research, I think is the is the main component. Uh, Pearl Harbor Day, which is December seventh in, uh, in uh, Ramadi. Ramadi is getting in the news again, but. These guys come in with tourniquets uh, with life-saving maneuvers. Uh, the other part is uh, what, talking about a few things as well. Damage control, we know the history of these things. Michael Rotundo uh, published this, uh, the, that, uh, the first study with this title, and that's because of uh, Bill Schwab, who was in the military, was a Navy officer, and that's when he used that term damage control. And this study that they published back then uh, that kind of started the revolution, or it was ongoing anyways, but it was really one of the uh, big uh, advocates for it, uh, was done because there's this one study on 46 patients. And you know, for a study with 46 patients to revolutionize surgery, I think is just amazing and revolutionary. So they didn't find a difference in mortality, so what they did was they looked at a subgroup and they said if you have uh, vascular injury and a lot of injuries that if you did damage control surgery on them that the survival rate went from 11% to 77%. And so that sounds like a good thing. But if you look at this data, um, what you find is that first row where it says 55 to 58%, that was the overall group. The group that got damage control versus the ones that didn't is about the same. I think everybody would agree 55 and 58 is about the same. But again, that they really emphasize the second row, the 11% versus 77% in the sick patients. There's a higher survival rate. But if you notice the rest of the data, if you're not that sick, your, your mortality rate goes up tremendously on people who got damage control because they didn't need that surgery. Okay, so I think that it's amazing that they forgot to really talk about that last row in their paper. They just talked about the first two rows and got this adopted. <coughs> 
so we know that this issue is partly due to the resuscitation, <clears throat> and we know about all of this stuff that has become popularized, and we're so happy that we found a $2 bag. But, uh, but nowadays, ventral hernia surgery and, and has become a huge component of general surgery, which was never, not even in existence when I was in my training. And this is iatrogenic, my friends, iatrogenic injuries that we're causing to each other, and we have to figure out whether this is a good thing or not. And, you know, I know trauma directors, some of them say if it's a trauma patient, we leave them all open for everybody, that everybody gets damage control laparotomies. So I think before we take our marching orders from uh, just about anybody, we have to really look at this. And we've uh, been able to show that doing damage control surgery and reducing it actually saves lives. So in, uh, in Arizona, we are not doing damage control surgery. There's an occasional one that we'll do about 5 to 10% uh, of the time, especially when I'm not in town. But uh, when I'm home, we don't do that much. But it, this has been the other wave where we show that when we stopped doing damage control surgery, laparotomies, that our survival rate is actually even better. So things such as resuscitating, uh, no, we need to stop the bleeding. Uh, we don't want to use those catheters, the swan gans catheters anymore in, in uh, open bellies. These are just a few of the things I think we've been able to change in medicine over the last couple of decades. And that's all part of doing research. And so uh, this is just an irrelevant picture that is grotesque, but people like it. <laughs> so, you know, as for the military crowd, we've all been out here. Uh, this is a Ramadi. And it's amazing that we're still operating in the mud, just like it was in the MASH days in Korea. But those are, uh, you know, experiences that we'll never forget, and it's been very valuable. And uh, I think that some of the, uh, the, the good times that the military has afforded us. Uh, I really thoroughly enjoyed my deployments because, uh, you know, I didn't have to think about who to shoot or anything like that. I got a chance to just help and serve our country and help humanity when people are hurting each other. But uh, there's other good bennies, such as uh, them letting me get onto a tank. Uh, my son likes this picture because he says I look like a North Korean. <laughs> but uh, where else does a doctor get to drive around a tank? And operate in shorts. So LA County, uh, where we were doing training for these military personnel, doing more research. Uh, helping people out is an area where we started to really talk about blood again. And this paper just came out last month, which is just you say uh, blood in your chest, you can give back into their veins after you filter it. It's not a big deal. It's better than throwing it away. And you can, there's a lot of these types of kits that you can use, and as long as you filter the blood, it, it's pretty good. And then you just uh, shove it back in with uh, any way you want to. And so this is just a video showing how it's done for those who are not used to doing this. But it's uh, something that we do in, in Arizona and I highly recommend. There's a lot of people that were worried about this technique because they were worried about the laboratory data showing that it's not the best blood, but it is your blood and it's what you had in your body a few minutes ago. Uh, the last uh, area of research I'm going to just uh, touch on briefly is this thing called pigtail catheters. I think of uh, all the things that I've done research-wise where we've been able to change medicine, I'm hoping that this one will take off more than anything else. And I think I'll be able to help more humans with this technique more than anything else. Uh, we use it for pneumothorax and there's plenty of that. And if I can get everybody in the country and then the world, China, Russia, Mexico, South America to do this, and the numbers of people that won't get large bore chest tubes tunneled into their chest, that's going to be a good thing. You know, the question is how effective it is. We've done the studies to show that small tubes versus big tube, it doesn't matter for blood. Um, it's effective for pneumothorax. It's effective uh, for hemothorax because I was uh, taught that blood comes out of any hole. We transfuse blood through 25 gauge IVs in the infants. Blood comes out of any hole. Clot doesn't come out of any hole. Clot doesn't come out of those chest tubes because it's jello. And I don't know if you know this, but you know when you put your chest tube on suction, the chest tube device, which is done with that three bottle thing, it was designed to minimize the suction. Okay, so we have a little hand pump now that we can use to suck out clot 
and they actually come out of any hole, any size hole, if, if it's, you know, as long as it's not a micro hole. Uh, this is a guy shot in the back, uh, goes through his uh, right under the clavicle, missed his uh, uh, subclavian artery. I was doing a laparotomy on someone else, and they would occasionally come in and tell me about this guy, and he was bleeding out about, got two liters out of his pigtail that we had put in. And so I got done with the case, took a look at this guy, we you know, booked him for the OR, because that's what the books tell us. And by the time I got to him, the dude's okay. <laughs> you know how much he bled out? Three and a half liters. How's that tube over there? Yeah. Okay, so and the reason he's okay, because right? the nurses just kept getting the blood back to him. <laughs> so uh, I wouldn't recommend and teach that you not operate on someone with three and a half liters of blood out, but this was over like six hours, and every time we went back to the guy to take him to the OR, he was doing so well, we didn't do it. So it's a new concept, um, but I know that when I was graduating from college with a mullet, that uh, <laughs> the things that I predicted was very different, but what I did do in, go in college was I used these things. You guys know what this is? Okay, I, all the old guys are doing this. Uh, these are computer cards, all right? And if when you type them, you don't know what you're typing because we didn't have computer screens, all right? All right, I know I don't look that old, I'm hopefully, <laughs> but this is the way it was. This is the very first Marine Corps Palm Pilot. We dreamed of car phones. And I had a Motorola flip phone when I was with President Clinton in China. I thought that was the hottest stuff out there in the world, okay? The future of medicine, we can take hearts from dead people and stick it into dying people, okay? That was not conceivable 50 years ago, all right? You can shoot lasers into your eyes so you don't have to wear glasses, okay? The things that we can do in the future is going to be astronomical, and you can't Imagine what we're going to be able to do. Can I have sound on this? Son, I take care of my own. You get me what I need, I'll see to it you get your legs back when you rotate home. Your real legs. You know, extremity uh, transplantation, that's going to be in our future as well. Uh, Giffords was shot. I, uh, there was a mass casualty in Tucson. I got a lot of press from that. Uh, got to meet the folks. I got to have dinner at the White House and got to sit across the table with the President of Korea, Michelle, President Ford, other important people, I guess. And, and the, that guy, who was very important. You know who that guy is? Harold and Kumar. He was a, he was a, a best well-known uh, Korean. That's why we, we, uh, he got invited to dinner as well. And then uh, the final benefit, I think, of all this, uh, I'm going to show this because Matt likes me to show this video. I, I got a F-16 uh, hometown hero uh, ride. This is the best way to travel that I can imagine. They paint your name on the blur bird. So the uh, the ten minute version is on YouTube. If you want to look at it, just type in uh, Peter E F sixteen. But uh, we ended up pulling ten G's. But he won't admit it because if if he says that he, we pull ten G's, they have to rip the whole airplane apart. 
But uh, anyways, I just want to say uh, the research, uh, you can't change the world through research. That's going to be one of the only effective ways to do it. It's called soft power versus hard power. Hard power is when you demand someone does this, and you can do that with rank. But when you convince your troops why it's a good mission, that uh, it's a better way to do it. Um, it's an honor for me to be uh, chosen for the Ben Eisman lecture. And I just want to say thanks, and, uh, and thanks for enduring with me before lunch.